This is the Wow Signal podcast, a production of the Dream of the Open Channel. It's June 2014, and this is Season 2, Episode 3, Oblique Strategies, The Future of Humanity, Part 2. My name is Mike Mongo. I am guest host of this episode of Wow Signal Podcast, filling in for regular host Paul Carr, who is out working on a new side project, which is very exciting and I'm sure we will hear more about in the future. In the meantime, once again, my name is Mike Mongo. I'm an astronaut teacher. I work with Paul and the team on Wow Signal Podcast. My interest is on the interstellar space exploration side of things. I am very much into exotic physics and the unexplained can can hold my attention. I'm, I'm not a big proponent of this thing or that thing, but I love to hear a good story. I work with Icarus Interstellar. Icarus Interstellar is, of course, the largest interstellar space science advocacy organization in the world, and I am the and I am the Chief Branding and Culture Officer at Icarus Interstellar. I travel a great deal and meet with groups of young students and encourage young students to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and astronautics. And along with that, I also present regularly at space conferences and science conferences to other scientists and researchers on how to go about encouraging young students to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and astronautics. If for any reason you're interested in that subject, I can be reached on Twitter at Mike Mongo or our MikeMongo.com or Google Mike Mongo and, and I'm not the rapper. So this episode of Wow Signal Podcast is on the future of humanity. It's, it's a continuation of the future of humanity thread. And, but we're also going to talk a little bit about interstellar expansion. It, it's, it, it fits into what we're going to be discussing. It's in two parts. The first part is with Heath Rezebeck of The Long Now. I interview Heath Rezebeck. He works with The Long Now Foundation. And related topics, Heath and I have known each other for some time. Coming after that is Paul Carr interviewing futurist and economist Robin Hansen. Robert Hansen is, is very well known for predicting where the market is going to go and and potential developments in the marketplace as well as uh, sociological developments of the future. He's a very interesting fellow. First up, as I said, is Heath Rezebeck. Heath is a futurist librarian. He and I met at the 100-year starship in in, uh, 2012 and have become good friends ever since. So without further ado, here is... Me, Mike Mongo, interviewing Heath Rezebeck. here with Heath Rezebeck, librarian and futurist. Hi, Heath. Good to hear from you. Heath and I met presenting at the 2012 100-year Starship. I saw recently that you were working with the Long Now Foundation. Yes. It's a very exciting project, but uh, Stuart Brand and Danny Hillis were two of the founding members. Um, Stuart Brand is the, the author of the Whole Earth Catalog. Yes, yes, the, the venerable uh, publication that is and was and always will be the Whole Earth Catalog. You know, I think really always been uh, looking at our sustainability, the way that we approach the future, the idea of the future, and uh, Danny Hillis 
as a computer scientist who had been uh, working on a plan, a fairly ambitious plan for a very long-running clock. And this clock is continuing design and well into physical prototyping, but it's designed to be a 10,000-year clock. What's the name of that clock? Well, the the clock of the long now, actually, oh, oh, right. or the 10,000-year oh, right. clock. I first heard the long now on Boing Boing. I used to work with Mark from Boing Boing. What? Mark Fraunenfelder? Yeah, he and I met at I Might. I have just ma- mangled Mark's last name. But. He and I met at Might Magazine in, uh, right when Wired Magazine started. That's where I met Kevin Kelly, and that's how yeah. this whole thing, crazy thing. And, and Kevin also, Kelly's, of course, uh, you know, greatly involved in Long Now Foundation at this point as well, has been for some time. So I met, uh, through Kevin Kelly, I met Stuart Brand, and Stuart Brand has always been a big deal to me because the whole Earth catalog is like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe for our planet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So how did you get involved with the Long Now Foundation? I mean, I had been aware of them for some time, and a- interestingly, I had actually become aware of them through another hero of mine, uh, artist and musician Brian Eno. I've long been a fan of Brian Eno's work, whether it's his production work, working with musicians, or he's he's created this incredible um, uh, brainstorming tool or artist tool called Oblique Strategies, yes. which is a card deck that you can use to draw ideas to, to sort of get you out of your rut. I had read something from him about um, Long Now, the clock of the Long Now, and it was I think was something that he had arrived at. The uh, he when he went to first visited New York, uh, he saw differences between the short now and the long. You know, there was no long now. Now meant this room and and five minutes ago or five minutes from now, there was no concept of even next month, much less next year, next century. Sorry to interrupt. He had a difference between the present now and a different version of now? I think culturally... And you can experience this at something like a conference. If you're if you're in a room full of people working on a particular thing, you enter a different kind of time. You're focused in on what you're doing, and uh, a short time can seem like a long time. But but I think what he was describing was uh, an experience in in you know the circles of artists he was meeting, in the cultural circles he was meeting, where there simply wasn't much consciousness of the relevance of something further away than the next five minutes. It, it took a special effort to to um, jar your thinking into a longer frame of reference. So they began to develop different tools around, you know, long now to to enhance this. One of one of my favorites I sort of hinted at earlier, they they decided that we should start now on planning for the, the year 10K problem by putting a trailing or a leading zero before our year dates. So the founding date of 1996, when you precede with that zero, it's 0, 1996. You've got that extra digit just waiting for the 10,000, the, the Y10K problem to come along and be solved. The point is you suddenly move into a different frame of reference. You know, that, that, uh, leading zero reminds you that this, this sliver of time that we occupy is, is really in the first, um, digits of its, of its, you know, first two digits. You know, changing the ways that we think about the future, and and in a playful manner. I think something like the ten thousand year clock is something that's in, incredibly audacious to 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 set out to build. And actually, in, in a recent, they did a recent uh, um, talk and podcast where Brian Eno and Danny Hillis were talking about the Long Now Foundation up to this point and the and the project. And uh, Brian had said that when he heard about it, he thought to himself two things in succession. One is why in the world would anyone set out to do that? And the punchline to that thought was, why not just tell everyone you'd done it and be done with it? Because the idea itself is sort of sort of already jars you into a new way of thinking. But he went on to say, there's something about putting your money where your mouth is and, and moving to create something in the world that the world has to encounter, has to um, question, has to put in some kind of context. So, right. so just by creating a clock... By implementing a clock that works at on a ten thousand year time frame, that's sort of a it's like a ten thousand year stopwatch, or <laughs> and, and so so by having that, it makes us think differently. Like we start to think about the ten thousand years instead of thinking about like just today or tomorrow or next week or next year or, or even a hundred years. 
Is that even if even if all you think is that's a completely absurd proposition, <laughs> humans, you know, whatever you think, you've already sort of sort of been tricked into thinking beyond your here and now. Even if all you're doing is dismissing the idea, you've had to think about ten thousand years from now in order to do it. But the fact of the matter is, you know, they've got a, a borehole drilled in a West Texas mountain. At this point, they've spent years since nineteen ninety six doing oh nine oh nineteen ninety six doing uh, the engineering work needed to slowly and surely move in that direction. Um, I've always known of them as a group, you know, that was was not shy of taking bold steps and bringing them about in reality. The, the Rosetta Disk, which is a shipping product that's right now on the Rosetta Probe as it approaches uh, Comet 67P at this moment, w- was put on there in a prototype form in 2002. So at any rate, you know, I'd known about them for some time and I had known two things. One that was that a library of the long now was always a part of their plans. And two, that they're building a new headquarters in San Francisco. And they're building a salon space there in San Francisco to to, to serve as a venue for talks, to serve as uh, a place, you know, to go and and, and as a repository for their for the organization's byproducts and the organization's thinking. How did you get brought into this? Alexander Rose, uh, the executive director of the Long Now Foundation, put out a little call on um, LinkedIn, I think it was. He said something a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but, uh, you know, when I saw it, I thought, I may, I, I should send my CV. <laughs> but it was, see, they were looking for an intern to uh, work on this project. What he said was, you know, if anyone knows of any post-apocalyptic librarians out there, send them our way. I thought, well... Uh, apocalypse or non-apocalypse, I've certainly been, you know, working on um, some of the work that you've seen me do in relation to um, 100-Year Starship and our eventual interstellar prospects has to do with very long-term archival. So, you know, I thought I would... That's, 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 that's what you presented on, this archival information at 100-Year Starship and Starship Congress, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so your yeah. you're futurist librarian has a... Uh, emphasis or a connotation of archivist as well. You know, archivist is a very particular track. I don't uh, pretend to be uh, trained as an archivist. Um, I work in public libraries. It's sort of my day job. This has become very long-term preservation of the cultural, biological, and scientific record has become, I guess, an intense hobby at this point. Um, But I'm always pursuing it and always interested in ways to move it forwards. So you responded to you responded to a post on LinkedIn, some a sort of tongue in cheek post on LinkedIn. I mean, it was tongue in cheek in its phrasing, but again, remember the Long Now Foundation, as I had sort of mentioned, by by uh, it, it's partially an art project in a way. I mean, in a way, putting these ideas out there in a in a way that entices that that causes curiosity. A ten thousand year clock? Are you crazy? You know, these kinds of things. A, a leading zero? What are, what are you doing? gets you to look further. So I knew they weren't fooling around. You know, I knew they were truly setting out to take the first steps on a a long journey towards an eventual library of the long now. Uh, And it started with this collection, and the the first task needing to be done was get this thing populated in in their salon. So applied and spoke with Alexander, and, you know, things worked out. And myself and a team of other uh, volunteers that had also expressed interest in the project just began this process of uh, working, tackling how we would build and curate and crowd curate that 3,500 volume collection, which is small, but in the end, to, to do it in a to do it quickly is um, is is also difficult. So, what's the idea here? Where you and I connected in the past and how we met each other was through, I, I mean, I am interested in interstellar space exploration. And as an astronaut teacher, I happened to bump into Icarus Interstellar and they sort of led me to see the reality that inevitably humankind will go to another star system. But mm-hmm. you were at the same events that I was. Yeah, some of them. So what's, yeah, some of them. So what's the uh, tie in with long now and humankind in another star system you know i mean i think it has to do with with long-term thinking and with the um with having the the chutzpah with having the drive the will the uh, audacity to uh say we're gonna 
set on this path, and we know this path leads to something that we can't figure out how to achieve at the moment, but simply by setting on this path, we're, we're increasing the chances that we'll get there someday. So, so some people will look at a 10,000-year clock and think that's completely impossible. Some people will look at a, a starship and think that that's completely impossible. For my part, when, when I encountered the uh, call for papers for the 2012 100-year starship conference, I had two thoughts in quick succession. Well, the first thought was that's an admirable goal. It's a long-term goal. I'm really interested in long-term goals. And, and a second thought was 100 years, a lot can happen in 100 years. And I think between now and 100 years from now is a period of time when we need to make sure that we maintain our uh, capability as a civilization, maintain our vision, maintain our vigor, maintain um, our ability to carry out those kinds of um, long ambitions. When you, when you say maintain, are you, are you suggesting there's some sort of threat? There is a concept for, to label the risk that humanity may not endure to achieve its full potential, and that, that is termed existential risk, and that's a, or X risk. And that's a subject that I had become interested in as well. Fairly recently, by gain, sometimes gaining terminology can be really key in sparking uh, more thought. And before you have terminology to grapple with an idea, it's almost like it slips right past you. You can't quite wrap your mind around it. Some of these things with long-term archive were planted in my mind when I decided to become a librarian back at, like back in 1992. Uh, Gregory Benford is partially responsible for me becoming a librarian, even though he himself uh, was writing a paper called Saving the Library of Life, I believe is the, the name of the published paper, he was writing about the about biological preservation and was writing outside of his field as a science fiction author, but in a way that galvanized and challenged the reader to to think about those things. So you never know what you might be able to do once you encounter the terminology needed to grapple with what you hadn't been able to grapple with just before. Are you talking about saving human cultural artifacts for someone besides humankind? If there is an existential threat, then who would we be saving this information for? Part of who's, what who's the audience for a project like this? You, when you yeah. and I first met, I, we were on the bus back from the uh, Johnson Space Center, I believe, and you had brought up the Fermi Paradox. Yeah. Is this connected with this idea of if there is an existential risk that humankind would cease to exist, what is the intent of saving information then, of preserving something well, in posterity? You know, different people would say different things, and it would depend upon they would depend upon their view of the value of humanity, their view of the value of life. In the, you know, in the case of uh, Benford's proposal, he was strictly concerned with endangered biodiversity. Cultural records really didn't enter into his original schema, and his his so this is a slight detour to explain his concept, and I'll get back to what you were asking sure. me there. His statement, his challenge in 1992 was to say, the, in 1992, mind you, oh, 1992, if you will, from a long now perspective, if the rate at which we are depleting our biodiversity is so great right now that taxonomy is a luxury, that what we need to be doing right now is preserving, and his uh, proposal was cryogenically, the most d endangered uh, biological samples that we have access to, so that if this is puberty, and we make it through this sort of game of chicken with ourselves, you know, things people do crazy things in their teenage years, we outgrow puberty, we can actually recover what otherwise would have been lost forever, that biodiversity. So some would say, you know, I really don't care what happens to civilization, but biodiversity, the last... One thing I'm saying lately is, is uh, the last Bengal tiger on Earth is the last Bengal tiger in the galaxy simply because there is no other Bengal. We can say that simply because whatever we're worth, we're the only one of it that we know of. Not that, that, that we're only, the only uh, life out there. We have reason to think that perhaps life is ubiquitous. We, the Fermi paradox, which is the question of why we haven't encountered any of it yet, might tell us, well, there are a lot of unanswered questions. But there may be lots of life. Biodiversity itself, and I'd say cultural diversity itself, because I value human culture as well, is an irreplaceable resource in and of itself. It, everything has an inherent value in and of itself is worthy of some kind of preservation. So the, the question of what, why you're preserving and for whom really is something I think individuals, every individual has to answer. So, so in, a, in a sense then, preserving the information is its own reward. 
I also think that's a really interesting question because one thing to back up to the manual for civilization, one thing that comes up when you talk about this as well, the question we're asking ourselves in curating it is, if you had to restart civilization, what books would you want on your bookshelf to do that? Uh, apocalyptic thinking aside, the thought itself is what counts for um, sparking new ideas about the now about what you value in the here and now, and the fact that what you value in the here and now shapes how you're going to carry out your future. Cory Doctorow has said that, that uh, if you want to change the future, you need to change the story that we tell ourselves about it. So, so a, a facility that we're focused on preserving the, the cultural, the biological, and the scientific record would do a number of things. To look at, let's say that the model carried out for, for the biological record was similar to Benford's proposal. Well, I'll tell you right now, I mean, that would be a very galvanizing, uh, uh, move to make. In the paper in 1992, of course, the, the outcry was huge and the peer review was scathing and it was, you know, you're gonna, you know, preservation needs to be done. Taxonomy is incredibly important. We have to work on, on, on making sure these species don't go extinct. What in the world do we do if, if our, um, um, charismatic megafauna are cryogenically frozen before they're extinct, you know, but it makes them ask a question in a way that cannot be denied. So it's galvanizing to hopefully to action, you know, hopefully to telling ourselves a different story about our near term potential, our, our near term prospects. OK, like I, like I suggested that archiving is, is uh, as I'm understanding it from you, what I'm getting from what you're saying is its own reward and then what you how you look at it or how we look at it is what we can take from it. And we don't necessarily have to take anything from it, and yet the opportunity is there. And if we do take some something from it, then we may be able, we may come up with a new idea. Well, I would dare say that uh, by, by making such a bold move in the first place, everybody who encounters it and even understands it at all is, is automatically going to take something from it. So the, so the medium-term scale is, is – so, so what's our short-term – our short-term payoff is that perhaps in the process of creating such facilities, and, and I would like to see su uh, such a cultural institution be a widespread type of facility. It's a different mission than universities have, than public libraries have, and even the nature and science museums have, simply because the idea is that it would focus explicitly on, on our, our long-term prospects and what, we're do what our place in the here and now is in relation to the arc of history, the arc of, of human history, the arc of natural history, the arc of scientific history. So in the here and now, a kid, um, without even needing to reach the hard questions yet, may just uh, spark a change in the way they approach their future. That's an immediate payoff and benefit to to creating projects that cause people to think about the very long term. Well, that's okay. funny because you, I mean, that's my connection with space is, is students yes. and kids. And, mm -hmm. and, and when we engage with kids on the subject of space and what you're saying is on the subject of archiving of a humankind legacy, then just by having that interaction, and for me it's asking a kid what they want to be and promoting the idea of space or astronautics as a career, and just by introducing that idea, and in your case it would be this preserving human culture and our cultural legacy. As that, well as biodiversity or scientific knowledge, yeah. That their ideas change. Yes, it, ideas change. It and, spark and that, an idea. And, and that takes time. What did you tell me? How do you build a pyramid, Mike? So and, you build then, a pyramid and, by saying we're not going to build the pyramid. You're going to build. You're going to build. You're going to build, build, build a starship. And actually, it's, it strikes me as funny because you know the pyramids are obviously <laughs> were constructed under great duress, right? That's not quite the model that we're shooting for. But in so terms we've of changed. Its monumentality, and part it, of the reason we've changed is because human yes. consciousness, the like how we think about things, has changed. And yes, so, and yet, and yet, we can't envision building something akin to a collaborative opt-in pyramid. It's interesting you should say that. Part of the reason is because of what we think of the now. Yes, I think that, that's, a, that's really interesting. I think you may be onto something. We simply can't see it. as, as a, So by putting these projects out there, something like the clock of the long now, something like, you know, a, a hundred-year starship, a, a century ship, we, we, we start a dialogue. So anyway, that's an immediate impact, okay? So then there's a medium-term impact. And the medium inter term impact to explain that, um, I have to revisit the concept of existential risk or X risk. So when I first started to do my research and really dive into it, I mean, I had 
thought vaguely about it, and it's uncomfortable to think about the extinction risks and these kinds of things. I thought, well, you know, I'm going to read a, an article. It's going to have a list. Oh, this is a pandemic extinction. This is an as asteroid-based extinction, blah, blah, blah. But he really, Nick Bostrom at the Future, Future of Humanity Institute at, at Oxford wrote a key paper on this, and I don't have it up or I could cite it pretty easily, the source, but if you, if you Google that, um, or Google his site, you'll find it up there. Um, and I think the title is something like, um, Existential Risk Prevention or Mitigation. Oh, yeah, sure. As, as humanity's, um, I, most I, know, I know this work. Yeah. So, so he actually has four, only four categories there. And those broad categories are the following. The first category is extinction. Extinction is extinction is extinction. If the outcome is extinction, then end of story. The second two are two that we can impact. And the fourth one is something called subsequent ruination. That is, if we, if we survive and, and make it out, out of the cradle of civilization, something completely unforeseen someday cuts off, uh, li earth originating life's potential. And, and that's, 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 we don't have to worry about that right now. That's down the line. So we can set that one aside for the moment because we have a lot to get through between now and any kind of eventuality. So those middle two, we can affect. And they're very powerful tools for thinking about um, our capacity to do so. And they are called permanent stagnation and flawed realization. Now, permanent stagnation is actually familiar to anyone who's seen a post-apocalyptic movie in the last probably 30 years. It's the main model that we're, we're familiar with. It's the Mad Max situation. It's the situation where some kind of civilization grinds on, but without the capability, without the resources, without the wherewithal, without the focused knowledge needed to pull itself towards something greater. Flawed realization is a little more invisible to people today, which I find interesting. Flawed realization, in Bostrom's example, is something like we can survive this time, but only if we become something that is essentially a fate worse than death for civilization to become, a despotic dictatorship, a technocracy in which only a very few manage to make it. That would be flawed realization of our potential, likewise unacceptable. So those two tools are mitigated through education, in part, education, the ability to rebuild our potential, the, the idea behind, and I haven't even said yet, the name of the proposal that I've, you know, authored a paper on and continue to present on is called Vessel. The term vessel being chosen for, for all of its meanings that I can find. A container, a conduit, a medium, a bridge from here to there, a ship, right? For, for all that we have been and all that we might be. It, but what it would do is lay a floor, ideally, possibly, we can see it, laying a floor be, uh, underneath uh, civilization's capabilities that, that these sites, and right now we're used to everything being distributed in the cloud, and that's just fine, but if at some point people did not have access to that, in your sort of Mad it's as if in Mad Max the second movie weren't about an arena, but instead Mad Max makes its way to this facility where, where the the, 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 the fruit of cultural knowledge, of our biodiversity, of our scientific understanding up to that point was somehow preserved and saved and finds a culture there intact, living and thriving in a resilient way because of the knowledge that's been concentrated there. That's a basis from which you can work. And all the time between now and then, one can return to a place of learning like that for inspiration, for a reminder that we are capable of so much more than we give, give ourselves credit for, both good and bad. So that's the medium-term payoff there, and it has to do with those two uh, types of X risk, permanent stagnation and flawed realization, avoiding those two somehow. The introduction that I had to the subject was, in fact, your presentation at Starship Congress in Dallas last year. That's right. I mean, you and I worked, at, worked on Starship Congress together, and, but we both presented there as well. Yeah. And, and uh, that's, that's a, I remember the title coming from you from that talk. X risk 101, yeah. Right. Existential risk for interstellar advocates. Right. Yeah, and I, I actually got it down to 12 minutes at that point. It seems like I'm ready for the for the TED Talk moment or whatever. But, it, you know, you got to boil things down in order to, to be able to convey what needs to be conveyed. Before we go much further, I want to I wanted to quickly cap off the third time scale, which is the longest of time scales, right? You said, well, who's the audience? And in a way, it circles back to your original question. Even if we fail by creating something like the clock of the long now, even if the clock of the long now runs... For a hundred years without maintenance, a thousand years without maintenance, doesn't make it ten thousand years. 
it may someday be discovered and spark a thought once again. Even if, even if a vessel facility, a vessel archive existed, but was not able to foster a resilient society, you know, within a habitat or within whatever, you know, its proximity, it fulfills a third goal, which is that of a monument. And so a monument simply sits there and says, this is what we were. This is what we valued. This is what we chose to strive towards and, and to let whoever's viewing it to be the judge. On that note, I would like to remind our listeners that if you're interested in this particular subject matter, I would look up Heath Rezebeck's recent work on, excuse me, on the Centauri Dreams blog, Paul Gilster's blog. The last thing you wrote, Heath, on the vessel concept, which you're, you've mentioned here, referenced here a couple times, was one of the best things I've ever read on this subject. Well, and I should I should say interject and say the, the most recent ones. Thank you very much for 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 saying that about that piece and that it had that impact. My most recent pieces to Centauri Dreams have actually been fiction. I needed to take a little bit of a break and a little bit of a step back uh, without a real basis from which to work towards more in a concrete way. Right? That can be a frustrating place to be. So so I asked Paul if it'd be okay if I tried a bit of fiction, casting these ideas into a fictional framework. And I had, you know, written fiction in the past and delved back in, and I'm glad it was gratifying. In that particular piece, uh, the scenario was simply that, you know, there was a starship in the future where the passengers were immersed in a uh, collaborative dream that was being facilitated by the artificial intelligence which formed the backbone of the ship, which steered the ship. And, of course, that led to a great discussion, as Centauri Dreams often does, about whether or not artificial intelligences will reach that point, when they do, if they'll just get rid of humans anyway, all these things that can come from the simple spark of an idea like that. But it came from simply thinking, an archive is not only... An archive. An archive might be a wellspring for experience. So what are you doing with the Long Now Foundation at this time? So uh, we kind of reached a public threshold recently where we announced, you know, we had been doing background work on the project, had been uh, working on some tools for, for culling the information, inputting um, the, the books that, that had been recommended to us. We opened it up then to Long Now members for them to submit books to the pool and then to use a voting tool that I'm very interested in to, to crowdsort and what's called A-B sort that pool to begin to try and get a rough list. And then from that, you know, we're going to do some additional curation, some subject expert curation. Uh, Alexander Rose has been visiting some some tremendous personal collections. We're trying to glean information in many different ways in order to come up with a list that then will begin a drive to gather those books. And so coming up here, we'll begin to, you know, accept donations of books to be added to that collection. Uh, the Internet Archive is going to serve to mirror the books that enter into this collection such that they'll be able to be checked out and in a way use that library remotely. Wow. Well, it's a delightful uh, collaboration there. You know, then we'll begin the process of gathering. The 3,500 is the size of the eventual collection. The collection, when the salon opens, will be at 1,000 just to get it started. And Alexander has some great ideas about doing sort of an annual process of nominating new titles. And there might reach a point where the size of the collection is full. So to nominate a new title, you need to read a title out, you need to make your arguments for and against certain titles being in there. So some great ideas to keep it a growing, living, thriving thing over time, kind of like um, rebuilding the temple every 20 years. Uh, if you go to longnow.org slash salon, S-A-L-O-N, you'll see more information about the salon, about our goals for building it, about the process, and of course about the Long Now Foundation itself and the amazing work that they're doing. Great. Well, that I, we're doing, I guess I can say, I, even though I'm an intern, that we're doing. I appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate talking with you. It's been it's a great conversation. It's probably the farthest thinking work that I've ever discussed with anyone, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, may it be the first of many. Hopefully that some of the Wow Signal listeners will connect with us and follow some of the information cues that we gave out over the over this interview and connect. And let me throw out there as well, just if you want to get to a taproot of my own prior work, if you just go to labs.vessel.cc, you'll find that there. Once again, this is Mike Mongo with the Wow Signal podcast. This has been Heath Rezebeck. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Mike.
And that was futurist librarian Heath Rezebeck speaking about the Long Now Foundation. And sticking with the future theme of this episode of the Wow Signal podcast, is uh, up next is Paul Carr and his interview with futurist economist Robin Hansen. Thanks, Mike. Well, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, Heath really had me at Brian Eno, though, but he has a great inter- and interesting perspective on the long-term future. Now we'll come to someone with a very different view Someone with the perspective of a social scientist who's also been an AI researcher, and that's Robin Hansen. Robin Hansen is presently an associate professor at George Mason University in economics. And he's probably best known to people as the guru, uh, one of the leading thinkers behind prediction markets. But I didn't ask him about prediction markets. I asked him about his thinking on the future of what he calls M's or emulations of human intelligence. These are essentially computer people that are a lot faster and more efficient than you or I. It's also, these would be drawn from the best and brightest. So this is going to be a new economy. Now, pointing out, and and I have to admit, I'm a bit of an M skeptic. I think he, perhaps Robin Hanson is as well. We don't really know that this could work out this way. But if it does... There are interesting social and economic implications, and you're not going to like all of them. Most of us will find this M world very hard to live in, even though we might be quite comfortable in it in some respects. So Robin will talk about his analysis of how the world of robots replacing humans works out for humans, for robots, what it means for the economy, how long this phase of human history will be, which may not be very long, and what it means for the long-term future. As he will point out, we don't really know what the next phase beyond that could be or would be because these M's would take us places we haven't been before. Now, this is kind of what people talk about when they say singularity, right? Singularity is something beyond what we can see. But he doesn't really take that view, as you'll hear. This That's interesting that we're talking about this right now because this past weekend was the 60th anniversary of the death of Alan Turing and the Royal Society of London announced that the Turing test had been defeated. And one of the, the interesting complications of that is aside from defining what are the absolute qualifications of beating the Turing test, which is Turing test, of course, being a computer – being able to portray a human being in a way that would confuse or have another human being believe that instead of a computer, we were talking with a human being, which is parallel to what you're saying about M's and what, what, and what Robin Hansen is saying about human beings. And one of the interesting complications, like, like you noted that, that, uh, that there would be, it would not necessarily be something that we would like about M's, that there might be something about M's that, is disdainful or disadvantageous for us as human beings, and I can imagine a couple myself. People talk about security issues when we have machines able to impersonate human beings. There is the Alan Turing version. There is the Robin Hanson version of M's. There is uh, Marvin Minsky's AIs. And it seems like we're working to get to AIs. It seems like this is something that is inevitable for humankind, particularly as processing power increases. Moore's law that the process, Moore's law that processing power uh, doubles every eighteen months, and eventually we'll get to the point that supposedly either that it stops doing that or that we have the capacity that processing capability that enables M's or AIs to actually take place. Uh, as he will point out, there are social forces that none of us control that aren't that no one is planning or manipulating because they're. It doesn't matter what anybody wants or what anybody thinks. These things might happen anyway. They happen naturally. They just happen because that's what yeah. we're doing. That's how it works. Well, well, no no one planned the agrarian revolution. No one planned the industrial revolution. Or the internet revolution. Or the internet. It, it just happened. Thing, it was The time was ripe, and people were ready, and the technology was ready, and it simply out-reproduced <laughs> its rivals. And that... That's really where we are now. And 
the M's are not only going to be like chatbots that may or may not win the Turing test. And I, I think it's you know debatable whether the Turing test has really been passed. Right. Absolutely. But eventually, I think it will be. Uh, Certainly. That's, and that's the exciting thing about this is that the exciting thing about this conversation and your interview is that we could be engaging with a new form of life. Yes, which is essentially, as he will point out, we may want to think of them as our children or grandchildren. And as a parent, that's a little bit difficult for me to adjust to. But I think the point is that he and I both reiterate in this discussion is that difficult to adjust to is the way it's going to be, <laughs> no matter what happens. Uh, this is a fantastic subject. Yeah. And M's and AIs and, and Turing tests and and in, and intelligent computers. I mean, not just yeah. not just chatbots, not just something that can impersonate a human being, but something that has its own state or nature of person. Yes. Now, I have to point out, I am both an M skeptic and a singularity skeptic, but a skeptic is not a denier. And I think something interesting is going to happen. And I think something with artificial, I think artificial intelligence will be part of that. And This is someone who's actually thinking about one of the interesting things that could happen and what it would mean for society, what it would mean for all of us. And so this is an extremely important topic that we need to start thinking about. I I totally agree. I especially especially agree because of our our reliance on drones right now. So if we add intelligence to drones that and make robots that can think and kill, then – there's pro- there's real problems there. This really gets into the whole decline of violence thing. Our species is becoming less violent, but you know, is that possible that we could invent a, a new surge of violence uh, where robots robot violence? <laughs> and, and, and that's another topic that uh, that we haven't addressed here. But and I think he makes a very good argument that the M's won't have any incentive to harm humans. It will would be more like, uh, like just like humans don't have an in- – industrial humans don't have an incentive to harm hunter-gatherers. We might harm them incidentally, like by introducing diseases to them. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't go and slaughter them because we just don't – they're not a threat to us. So there's a lot of interesting possibilities, some of which are frightening. But again, all the possibilities are probably going to result in things that is very hard for people to get used to. Hello, Paul. Hello, Robin. Thanks, thanks for joining me. Nice to meet you. My podcast deals a lot with a lot of issues about the human future, and particularly, and not only the human future, but also the future of, or past or present of non-human intelligences. And I'd seen lots of, read and, and talked to lots of physicists and astronomers and computer scientists and so forth who have lots of ideas about uh, all these issues, but not too many economists. In fact, no social scientists at all. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, you're, we're overdue then. Yes, you are. And I know you're, you're probably best known at large as, as the, the guru of prediction markets. And I don't really have any burning questions about prediction markets. Maybe some curiosity questions, but, but I, I really wanted to focus on your, your discussion of the future economy in articles that I've read. You present one scenario, which I think you don't, you don't necessarily believe it's the only possible scenario, but you present a scenario. Of course, yes. In which emulated human brains or emulated humans live in virtual bodies and outcompete their creators by many orders of magnitude, you, you said that that would lead to that that could lead to economic growth that is you know exponentially faster than what we have now. Like every the economy do- instead of the economy doubling every few years, every I think it was fifteen years or something like that. That's right. Uh, it, it, it could go to and it really has that hasn't changed in a while. That that doubling rate, right? But but it did change a while back. Yes. That, that was the industrial revolution. So yeah, it's important to know that we have had these huge changes in growth rates before, 
So the Industrial Revolution was a change from a doubling time of every 1,000 years to a doubling time of roughly every 15 years. And that, that's a really huge change in growth rates. So that sort of thing could happen again. And it even happened before that in, with the farming revolution. Yeah, I, no, I noticed that in your talk that I saw, and, and I thought that was very interesting, that those were, in, in effect, singularities themselves. Now, in each, each of those cases, uh, going from hunter-gatherer to being farmers and going from farmers to being industrial workers, it was pretty rough on the first few gener- yeah. <laughs> first many generations of people that these sort of disruptions can be very disruptive. Uh, yeah. I mean, people change their entire way of life. You know, the life of a farmer is just a completely different life than that of a forager, and the life of an industrial person is a completely different life. And the whole new ways of life had to be created almost out of whole cloth. And uh, you know that that's very disruptive. Yeah, they found. I think archaeologists have found that our ancestors who became farmers became much were smaller in stature. Right. Uh, they, they they had diseases. They had. That that hadn't really sure. had a chance to propagate before. They'd had all kinds of others, but they had a lot more children. That was the only right. advantage that they had, and then that was enough. Yes, uh, I mean, you know, in a sense, the transition from foraging or farming was the central determining tra- trauma of human history. People had before then been very well adapted to their environment. They were foragers, and, and their life, their bodies, and their lifestyle, and their mental habits were all adapted to the life they had been living. The possibility of farming came out, and we had the cultural plasticity to be able to invent new cultures and new norms and new ways of doing things to uh, take advantage of that new possibility. But it took quite a bit of twisting of our psyche and, and our habits and our ways of what we think is appropriate to fit into that new world. And in many ways, we were never entirely comfortable with farming. And my story is that with industry and, and increasing wealth, we've been moving back toward forager waves because forager ways feel more comfortable to us and more natural. The, well, I think what is interesting is that about your work is you took an econo- economist point of view at, of this. Most people who've, who've theorized about the future are computer scientists or have a, a background in some technical background. You have a technical background as well. but I do. <laughs> I have a physics background and a computer science background. Yeah, you were an AI researcher for a number of years, I understand. I was, for nine years. What made you make that transition to becoming a social scientist? Well, I was sort of being a social scientist as my hobby, and I tried to make my hobby into a career. I've been trying to think about how to save the world and how to make things better, and, and that drew me into thinking about institutions and studying institutions, and then I decided I wanted to try to like make that my focus. I started my PhD at the age of 34. 34. That's when most are finishing up their PhDs or, or done. Long, long done. Yeah. So you took this economist perspective on what some people call the technological singularity, which I, I think that's just one way right. of looking at it. But, and I'm going to let, I'll, I'll provide a link in the show notes that the listeners can go and, and read your articles. There's also, you did a, a YouTube lecture. There's a YouTube lecture out there where you talk it's about TED this. Talk. TEDx TED talk. talk. Yeah. The question that I had is, have to do with kind of how that all works. I know that there's a lot of unresolved technological details in and how we would build yeah. brain emulations. And it's not entirely uncontroversial that we would ever get there. Some people who know a lot about it say it's not possible. So others say it is going to eventually happen. But let's take as as a working assumption that it does happen, that we can build these M's, as you call them, these emulations right. of ourselves, or at least of our the best humans that we have. Can you kind of walk us through how that leads to a much more rapid rate of economic growth? And what kind of economy are we talking about? From the beginning, let me say that people have been talking about the idea of emulations, or they call them uploads, for many decades. It's been a staple of science fiction. It's been a staple of futurists and techie uh, you know, con- late night conversations for a very long time. Oh, sure, but yes. Overwhelmingly, these conversations end up focusing on when would it happen? Would it be conscious? Would it be me? These sort of philosophical questions. And then people almost never like get to the point of trying to analyze and what would the world be, would be like? And many people think, well, that's just impossible because they think social science is impossible. They think <laughs> people are have free will and therefore, you know, nobody could possibly predict what will happen. And so there's this mental block people often have to sort of, that's even often given as the definition of singularity, like when when things change enough that you just can't predict beyond that point. And and as a social scientist, I just want to say that there is a social science. (laughs) We, we, We do have ways to analyze social systems, and it is possible to take these unusual technical assumptions and actually try to work through 
consequences using very standard social science and in particular economics. So, so, and that's my prelude. So now to start answering your question, why does the growth rate speed up? So we, we understand a lot about economic growth in our world. And one of the things we understand is that in our world, growth is limited by the fact that people are limited. We only have so many of them. They don't, we don't grow more of them very fast. We don't make them more skilled very fast. And that limits how fast the economy can grow. We, 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 to make things, we need people, and they need to be skilled. And we also need a whole bunch of supporting equipment, machines and buildings and trucks, et cetera. But all that equipment, all that capital, we call it, is, is relatively easy to make more of. And we could just be cranking that stuff out of factories by the bucket load if we wanted to. But it turns out there's not much point in making too much of that stuff because you, you need a certain balance of that in people. So... Uh, if we could make a lot more people, then we could make a lot more capital, and then we could have a lot more production and, and ability to do things, but we're limited by people. This emulation scenario is a scenario where you can make things that substitute for people, things that are as good as people, that, that do a people-like role in these jobs, and you can make those in factories. Mm -hmm. So you can crank them out of factories as fast as you can crank trucks and machines and buildings and everything else that we make today. Yeah, now I, I, I know a lot of listeners are going to be thinking right now about the ethical implications of cranking out something that might be conscious, right? Let's set, I'd like to set that aside just for a moment. I promise sure. the listeners will try to come back to that. So just let's just talk about the analysis for now. There's a bunch of things that follow from this. So, so when we can crank about these emulations out of factories as fast as we like, then the economy can grow very fast, but it also means that wages have to fall to the cost of making these things in factories. And that's what's called a Malthusian or subsistence wage economy, which means that wages would fall to basically subsistence levels for these emulations. And if subsistence level for an emulation is a lot cheaper than for a human, it means humans basically can't survive on their wages. Humans have to own something else. It's a world getting very rich very fast, so humans just have to own a small fraction of other stuff in this world to be rich and comfortable, but they do have to own something else. Uh, another implication is these things are easy to copy. So an emulation is a computer simulation of a human brain. And once you can make one simulation, you can just copy the file and make another one and make another one. That means that this new emulation economy will have a huge demand for emulations. Emulations will be very powerful and useful. But out of the 7 billion humans, they aren't going to equally copy all of us for uh, working in this world. They're going to be focused on the few most productive, most capable, most flexible human minds to become emulations to fill all of the job roles in this new world. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that, say, a few hundred humans will dominate this new world in the sense that most copies, most emulations will be copies of one of those few hundred humans. These emulations that we're going to make so many copies of, they, will they have just a virtual economy or will they actually be interacting physically with those of us who are left in the physical world? <laughs> so this is a complete economy. It's a real economy. It requires real resources and uses real resources. You know, they will have power plants and mines and factories and computer racks of computers and maintenance and cooling pipes and things that, that fix mistakes when they go wrong and disaster preparedness. And, you know, it's a real physical world, but it's a world much more focused on computers because computers are, you know, are the things that run the emulations and the, and the most valuable thing in the world is emulations, just like in our, the most valuable thing in our world are people. And so these emulations are being packed very close to each other in huge, dense, hot cities uh, so that they can interact with each other as closely as possible. But most jobs, like in our economy, are desk jobs. I mean, there are jobs where there's physical things to be done. There's mm -hmm. miners and there's drivers and there's janitors and there's manufacturers, etc. But most jobs are desk jobs in the sense of sitting in an office and exchanging memos and making plans and things like that. And so these simulations, most of them would be doing desk jobs. And for doing a desk job, they don't actually have to make a little simulated desk out of physical materials. They can live in a virtual reality and do their desk job at a virtual reality. Their, their job is still a real job in the sense they're doing something real for the economy. Something needs to be done and they're doing it. Just like you're at, when you're at your desk, you're doing something real. Just because you're at a desk doesn't mean you have a virtual job. It's a real job. Sure. Well, let me, let me, let's give you an example. Would crucial jobs like farming managing transportation, that sort of thing, where you have to be out among the... That, that's, right. that's also done by these M's? Or? That's right. That is, it's, not, it's straightforward to give them a robotic body. And in fact, 
humans already can deal with lots of different kinds of machines as if they were extensions of their body. So it's pretty clear that human minds can be put in all sorts of robotic bodies and function acceptably. So uh, these robotic bodies would be on large different scales. And another important thing to notice about emulations is you can run them at different speeds. So you could run an emulation 10 times faster, but you have to pay 10 times as much for the computer hardware to make it run that faster. So you can have tiny, fast uh, robotic bodies to run nano factories, or you can have big robotic robots who steal super tankers and, and the entire range in between. Um, but most jobs, of course, are not these physical jobs. They're desk jobs. The physical body you'd have to have would have to feel like a human body to this M, but it would actually... Well, it doesn't have to. I mean, we drive cars, we use bulldozers, we do all sorts of things. Yes. And we, we psychologically treat those as extensions of our bodies. People who run machines, <laughs> the, the machine feels like their body to the, as they use it on the job. It doesn't need to feel like exactly a human body to be able to be something you could work with and, and use productively. In your article, you said something about the economy could start growing so fast doubling every week, every month, every yeah. month, every week, that certain types of projects would be unappealing, like very large space travel, well, at least for a while. Yes. Cause it takes many, many years to get something to work. Well, sure. But just like even today, our economy is doubling every 15 years. So there's some kinds of projects that our farmer ancestors would go on to that we find, you know, t intolerably slow. We, we aren't building vast monuments or other sorts of things. Uh, and so these emulations, because if their economy is doubling every month, then uh, you know a, a one-year trip to Mars would just be intolerably slow. It's just might as well just wait until the economy isn't growing so fast anymore to be w interested in doing those things. Okay, now let's let's assume that my children or grandchildren are one of the lucky ones that owned shares and general emulations before yeah. <laughs> this happens. <laughs> what happens to them? In our world, there are still subsistence farmers out there. Sure. We just don't talk about them much or pay much attention to them because they're pretty marginal, but they exist. And there are even foragers still out there. There are mm -hmm. still a few thousand foragers, and they're way even farther on the margins. What happens to them hardly affects the rest of us. And so once an economy becomes dominated by emulations, humans will be pushed to the side. They will be not the center of attention. They will be not the center of action. They will hopefully be like retirees who are living comfortably in, in leisure land <laughs> where... <laughs> They, they enjoy the fruits of their investments and watch from a distance all the exciting action happening in the center, but they would not be the center of attention. Are we talking about a divergence here? I mean, unlike retirees, these people can reproduce. But very slowly. Oh, well, yeah. Like, if, so if the economy is doubling every month, <clears throat> sure. humans reproduce every 30 years, it's just not a contest. Well, I, I'm not talking about a contest. I'm, but, I, but for all practical purposes, from yeah. the point of view of the emulation economy, humans are just static. Yeah. They're just hardly changing at all, and they can be mostly ignored. So if, if humans and human needs are not that big a deal in this economy, what, you know, maybe 1% of the gross domestic product is taking care of the humans, then what is the currency? What, what's, what's, is the value just more M's, or is there... Sure. Uh, M's are very productive, but they need uh, computer, they need power, they need cooling, they need to be physically located near other ones. So there'd be large value in real estate, in computer hardware, in cooling pipes and communication hard, you know, hardware, and in software, of course, to run and manage all these sorts of things. Uh, those would all be expensive and valued. And these, these, these M's are self-interested entities? They so one of the nice things about analyzing M's is they are psychologically very human. Basically, you take a human and you scan it and you put it in a computer and when you turn it on, it doesn't realize it's a computer yet. Right. You have to explain it because it still remembers being a human and have to realize, well, you're no longer human now. You're an emulation. But psychologically, memory-wise, skill-wise, et cetera, it's just like a human. Now, it will diverge somewhat in this new world. It'll have new experiences. But still, we can understand how it will react to those new experiences by understanding how a human would react to such experiences. Now, but if the humans decide they want to engage in something like space travel or developing new technologies that are you know, they can't keep up with the M's, but they can do things that the M's wouldn't be interested in. Right. But So the, the key question is when. So the, the farming economy, you know, went through so many doublings and then something changed and made the industrial economy. And our industrial economy is going to go through so many doublings and then maybe something will change. The emulation economy will happen. And then if the emulation economy goes through a similar number of doublings of growth, as did the industrial economy or the farming economy or even the forager economy, then it will reach the end of that path within two years. And then something else will happen. And I'm not telling you what the something else is. 
I'm just saying, I'm going to try to tell you about this emulation era and what it's like, but I'm not telling you it's going to last for trillions of years. It's going to last for a couple of years, and then something else will happen. But So if you're a human on the outside, that doesn't give you a, a lot of stability assurance. <laughs> There's this world, and while if this wor- world of emulation functions, you have some idea of how to relate to it and uh, how you can take advantage from it and the kind of risks that might be exposed from it. But on the time scale of 20 years or so I can give you almost no assurances because because growth rates speed up, it's pretty much guaranteed you, you get into strange lands on a short time on your lifespan. What I'm trying to get at right, is at some point we're going to use up all the energy resources of planet Earth. And in this scenario, that happens quickly in the sense yeah. that you know, if we're doubling every 15 years, then it might take a few centuries or a few thousand years for that to happen. If we're doubling every month, then it happens a lot sooner. At that point, do we start looking outside the Earth for more energy resources, or do we? Is, is this when they start to get sure, interested in space travel? At some point, they would expand, but you know, probably when the Earth was full and used up. And there is a lot of growth that's possible between where we are now, or even where an, emu- an economy would begin, and using up the entire Earth. The Earth is huge, so an awful lot would happen between now and then, and not just in terms of number of doublings. But yeah. my, my best guess is that these emulations would typically run about a thousand times faster than humans do. And so that means from the point of view of an M, the, their world is changing more slowly than our world changes. Right. I, I remember reading something today, just the, the amount of energy being used just for Bitcoin mining was a pretty, yeah. you know, on a human scale, a very large amount of energy, just, just for one computing application. There's a huge amount of, of network bandwidth that goes into just Netflix. Sure. You can't process information without energy. And right. there are physical limits to how low you can go. So at some point, and this, this gets into the Fermi paradox. Right. right. Well, so I mean, just there's, there's two issues. That is, the future is not all one big lump. Right. There, there are different parts of the future. And so this emulation analysis might be sort of the next era after our current era. And it will happen in a shorter time. And it's important maybe to think about what it's like. But it, it's not the long distance billions of years future. Right. Right. And so if you want to think about what things will be like in millions or billions of years, you have to take a different style of analysis. You can't just see what's going to happen next. Because it's not the next thing when you're talking millions or billions of years. It's the next, 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 way past things. Right. So you have to sort of go to more fundamental limits. To, right. to even if you have a way to analyze anything. Well, the one thing we, that we can regard as fairly secure is the conservation of energy. Right. So I, I'm, I'm a, I have a physics background, and I'm willing to assume that basically we've got some basic physics right. And not just conservation of energy, but we understand entropy, and we understand limits on increasing entropy, and we understand the finiteness of the universe we have in terms of, of its ability to hold entropy. And that basically means... Uh, we have a very limited ability to grow in the sense that we just can't grow for another 10,000 years even at current growth rates. Right. It's just we, we fill the universe and you know, therefore we can't go a million or a billion years at current growth rates at all. So clearly growth rates have to slow down eventually. Clearly we reach limits and capacity limits uh, certainly in terms of physical resources and therefore there will be this era – slow growth in physical capacity, slow growth in technology. And eventually that will happen, and it seems pretty confident it will, but an awful lot will happen between now and then. I see. And it's important not to think of that as the next thing that's about around the corner. Just because there will eventually be limits doesn't mean we're hitting them right now. Oh, no, I, I don't think we are. Well, some people do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I understand that there's a lot of concern about the environment in terms of climate change. is probably one of the big, the big things that are, people are concerned about now. But we could have more energy without greenhouse gases, so that's not necessarily a limit. You know, if you if you didn't care about what happened to the biological <laughs> beings, you, that that would even be a problem. Well, in the emulation world, that is an issue in the sense that part part of why we don't want to destroy nature is we depend on it, and, and if nature dies, we may die. For emulations, that's just no longer true. They're, they're made in factories. They they use you know they build things out of mines and, and factories, and they just don't need or use nature. They don't farm. They don't fish. They, they don't need the air to be clean. They don't need the water to be clean. They, they just don't need any of that. They may preserve some things in, in farms or, or zoos or whatever they, they like on small scales. But in, in the short run, 
they will be so focused on concentrating in a few huge dense cities that the rest of the earth they will largely leave untouched because they just don't care. Right. But that's only for a couple of years. <laughs> now, is the impetus to growth, the impetus to moving out into the solar system and then someday to other stars, is that impetus just the biological the analogous drive to, to make more copies of yourself? Well, so people often get stuck in the head of thinking that what will happen will happen because somebody wants it and therefore asking who would want this and what their preferences are, who has the desires to make these specific things happen. But many things in our world and in the world around us and in the past and also probably in the future happen not because anyone wants them, but just because there is selection. There are some things that if you do them, you more influence in the future, and other things, if you do them, you won't. And it doesn't matter why you do these things. It just matters that somebody does them sometimes. So that's, that's natural selection. Natural selection says we will evolve all these animals and plants who are good at living in a, in a niche and surviving and thriving and, and reproducing themselves. It's not because anybody, any animal or plant in the past wanted that or planned it. It's just because if any plant or animal does it, they will thrive. And we are still in that world now. Nobody runs the world. There is no grand plan. There are just 7 billion people who are mostly competing with one another, who are doing different things. And some of those things will produce growth that will expand and others of them won't. And that will just continue for a long time. So the M's that want to expand will be the ones that we see in the next generation of M's. Right. So, so there are many things about this M world that are hard and tough and humans who look at that and say, I don't want to do that, they'll just be selected out. They won't be doing that. It'll be the humans who say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm up for that. Those are the ones who will be made more copies of, and those are the ones who will end up dominating the M economy. If we take the agrarian revolution and then the industrial revolution as a model, it's going to be a rough time for those first, not, not sure. just the first people, the first Ms, right? Absolutely. So right off from the bat, I mean, the emulation process will be faulty. It will be imperfect. And so it'll be weird. I mean, we already have alienation in our world in that our world is not like the agrarian or even the forager world that we're psychologically most attuned to. We, we live in this urban, advanced civilization and, and many aspects that are just alien. Alienation is about the psychological effects of living in a strange world. And for these M's, their world will be even more alien than our world is because they will be in a computer simulation and their minds will be emulated and their body will be emulated and it won't all be exactly right. And some of it will be a little weird and a little bit off. And their, their work jobs will be different and they'll be working a lot of hours. Their habits of like marriage and birth and life cycles, those will all change too because the simulation economy has just different time cycles and different ways of reproducing. And all of that will be different. And the first emulations will have to figure out how to get used to that. And, you know, many of them won't and many of them would fail. But because they can just keep trying different humans to see how well they work and make lots of copies of the ones that work well, after a while, we'll find the ones that seem best adapted to this world, and the world will be dominated by them. Are they stuck with the copies of the humans that were originally became M's, or do they, can they tinker with themselves? Well, so there's different eras. There's different parts of this era. So it's going to be easier to analyze the early eras when fewer things are possible, because the more things are possible, the harder it is to analyze the consequences of those things. So the, the very earliest emulations will just be copies of humans, and there'll be a limited number of what I call tweaks, ways to change them and make them more excited, make them more lethargic, make them more focused. But th there won't be that many of these tweaks, and so you'll, you'll have a limited range of, of ways you could tweak them, but that's basically going to be what you started with. But uh, with time, they'll study these things and figure out how to experiment with them and try different things, and eventually they'll learn more design principles and more ways to change them, and then that will allow you to morph from what you started with. You'll also have the possibility of learning how to emulate not just a, a, an adult brain, but the development process that starts from an embryo. And with that, you could grow in new brains and emulate the growth of new brains, and therefore start with brains that never were human, but just are emulated all the way through. So you could have rebellious teenagers in this world. and <laughs> Well, you'd want them. You would, even, you, you would actually, you know, initially the very first M's, you'd want to be taking people who already know how to do something so you can sell. You want, you want corporate lawyers, you want software engineers, you want people who are at the peak of their productivity, like, you know, 40 to 60 years old, 
those would be the people initially in demand because the very first application is, okay, now I'm going to sell your work to go do stuff and, and I want somebody who already knows how to do things. But right. after a little while, what you'll mostly be interested in is those who are able to be trained to do new kinds of jobs in the emulated world, which aren't the same jobs that human did before. And so you want young, flexible minds so that you can train and move in the direction you want. So that means you want teens or kids, really. And so at the time when the emulation, emulation revolution happens, the most in-demand humans will most likely be kids. Hmm. You know, after the very initial burst of just who can we grab that already knows how to do something and, you know, sell them straight out. But as the world changes, you'll want the kids because they're flexible. So that, that, that brings out the issue of immortality. These emulations are in a sense immortal in the sense that they are on a computer, they can have backups. There's nothing in particular that kills them. And so they could in a sense live subjectively for thousands of years. But there is a way in which human minds tend to get more fragile with time. And this will, should happen to emulations too. And what this means is that eventually emulations will become so crystallized and so adapted to very specific environments that when those environments change, they will just not be productive workers anymore. They could then retire and have an indefinite life of leisure as a retiree, but there would be a finite productive lifespan for them. And that might be a century or two, but still uh, yeah. emulations would retire and end. Now, the emulations, could have, they could have their own savings, their own of course. money? Yeah, right, okay. of course. So they would essentially be full citizens with... Yep. Well, they could be. I mean, in a sense... Slavery is, impo- is impossible too. The, the, the basic economics of the situation don't determine what rights they have. Uh, right. They give you some suggestions, but they don't determine it. So, uh, but an awful lot of things don't depend on that. Now, so, right. you know, so it's, it's just a fact of history that there's actually not that much point in enslaving people when wages are at subsistence levels because it costs just as much to feed a slave as it does to feed a worker who isn't a slave when their wages are at subsistence levels. So there's not much point in enslaving them. It brings me back to the ethical question of, do I own the M's that I've created uh, at generation one? Do they belong to me or do they have their own ownership? So um, it's important to notice that, you know, in these past big transitions, if you had asked people if you had told people what's happening and the changes, that this is what's likely to happen, and do you approve? Do you think this is ethical? Do you think this is appropriate? Most people would have said no. <laughs> they, were, they were going to change dramatically how the entire society works in ways that violated a lot of the previous norms and things people held there. We are rich compared to our former ancestors, but we've rejected a lot of things they had very dear. We are not very loyal to our clan. We are not very uh, you know, martial Military virtues are, are set aside. We're not very loyal to our spouses. We're much more promiscuous. We don't work as hard as they think we should. I mean, there's just a lot of ways in which we have rejected things that our farmer ancestors held very dear. And even going farther back, for, farmers just rejected a lot of what foragers held there. For, foragers were very egalitarian. They shared. They uh, you know, had small groups where everybody, anybody could leave when they wanted, and farmers just threw all that away. They, they produced, reproduced hierarchy. They produced property. They had ownership of people and, and property and inequality and war and slavery and just all sorts of things that horrified foragers. And you know, if, you hold the, if you're going to hold close to the lifestyle you live now and the way it, things feel right around you now – any really different world is probably going to horrify you on a number of different dimensions. Yes. And so that's the kind of situation you should expect to be in. And you have to decide your overall attitude or how tolerant you're going to be to imagining a very different world where functionally you know, the requirements are to do things very differently and decide sort of how far you're, it's okay to go from what you're comfortable with and the world you live in. As we've, I pointed out earlier, I, I, you have regard the whole M scenario as – one possible future scenario. Sure. In what can you summarize for us how we might intervene and make things different? I don't think we can much. <laughs> that is, there may be different scenarios, but it won't be because of things we choose. I see. It'll be because of the nature of the world that determines the different scenarios that happen. So, so emulations may just not be physically possible. It, it may be that computing power reaches a peak and we can't we were stuck and we can't increase computing power past a certain point. Uh, it may be that there are very subtle, very fine details in the brain that are determining how brains are worth in a 
work in important ways. It may be, of course, that the world economy stops growing and, and doesn't reach new technological abilities. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of possibilities to consider. None of those are necessarily because of choices we make. We honestly, it, and it's scary, we are not running the world. We, and we haven't been for a while. Technology is, is somewhat of an autonomous force. Growth is somewhat of an autonomous force. We each, it's in our interest to contribute to the growth that we've had. But if we all wanted to stop it, it would be really hard. Uh, you'd, you'd agree that it's a, it's a very complex problem, what's really going to happen. And we can't really... Of course. But, but we should sit down and use all we know to try to predict. So, I mean, here, the scenario I'm thinking about, like intelligent machines, is not like a strange out of the... <laughs> world scenario compared to what a lot of people have been thinking about for a long time. The idea of intelligent machines has been one of the most central scenarios for a big change in the future, uh, in futurism for the last half century. Of course, it may never happen in some sense, but if it does happen, then there's a number of different ways it can happen. And emulations, I think, is one of the main ways it could happen. So it deserves consideration on, on that count. Right. Although, I mean, I, when I describe these things, I think people get too focused on the humans yeah. and not enough on the new descendants of humans. Right. Who, who are by far more new, numerous and more capable. And you might think of them as your descendants. You might imagine being one of them rather than being one of the humans on the margin on the side. I think that's, that's something that will take some getting used to, but maybe we should start thinking that way. Maybe. Okay, well, thanks for your time, Robin. Take care. Bye-bye. And that was Paul Carr interviewing... Futurist economist Robin Hansen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Wow Signal Podcast, and we want to know what you think. You can post about it on your blog, post on Reddit, you can tweet us. Just Google Wow Signal Podcast, and one of the many ways to get a hold of Wow Signal Podcast will reveal itself utilizing the might of Google. Wow Signal Podcast is the kind of thing we are always looking to involve our listening audience. So if you have a question or a comment, feel free to email us at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and we may have you on the air. Finally, we produce Wow Signal Podcast with our own money, with our own love, with our own passion. And if you, the listener, have a little spare change and want to support the Wow Signal Podcast, you can do so. We are now users of Patreon. And you can support Wow Signal Podcast on a per episode basis. Just go to patreon.com forward slash wow signal for details. Even a little amount helps. Say you, you pledge a one dollar per episode. That would be fantastic. If you, if you do five dollars an episode we'll send you a t-shirt or a coffee mug or some such. And even thank you on the air. Uh, yes that's right we'll publicly thank you on the air. For very large amounts to be specified later, we will read poetry to you. Yes, that's right. Or we'll have somebody famous read poetry to you because we have that sort of resource. If you want to give us money, we can figure out something to make you happy for that gift. And that's it for this episode of the Wow Signal Podcast. Here's Erica Lloyd. We're going to go our outro. We're kind of fond of the music we play here. Our outro today is Erica Lloyd with Time Pops Bubbles to, to take us out. This was episode three of season two of the Wow Signal podcast. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregation service, such as Stitcher or Pocket Cast, so you'll automatically get the new episode as soon as it comes out.
This is the Wow Signal podcast. This episode was written and produced by Mike Mongo and Paul Carr. Please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com for links and more information. All spoken content of the Wow Signal podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. Music was by DJ Spooky and Erica Lloyd. All music is either Creative Commons or presented with the permission of the artist.